Good afternoon. Rembrandt made himself famous throughout Europe, not with his paintings, but with his etchings. Twenty years after his death, the Florentine Filippo Baldinucci, writing about the art of engraving, mentioned Rembrandt's printmaking technique uh, as, and I'm quoting him now, the most bizarre manner uh, which he invented for engraving on copper with acid, a method that was all his own, neither used by others nor seen again. Rembrandt used certain scrawls and scribbles and irregular strokes without outline, says Baldinucci, um, and he created a deep chiaroscuro, he means contrast of light and dark, of great vigor and picturesque flavor. What struck contemporaries as bizarre was the variety of lines, uh, from loose and quick, uh, like here on the left on the landscape, to methodically cross-hatched uh, in the half-light, to deep and dark and blotty. Rembrandt didn't invent etching, uh, though Baldinucci was ready to give him credit, <laughs> but he did push its potential for describing the world in black and white farther than anyone ever had. Today we're going to look at how he did that. But to begin with, uh, I want us just to examine one picture. I'll return to the subject of the so-called hundred guilder print, but right now I simply want you to look at it, look at the whole thing, and look at some details I'll show you without my making any comments. Well, you see right away what and who is important. And you're given a, you're, you're given a lot of cues. Uh, Christ is highest, the apex of the triangle of figures, and he's silhouetted against a dark niche-like shake. And almost everybody is looking toward him. There are about three dozen people here, uh, and there is a great deal going on, but we're able to make some sense of it because important individuals are picked out of the crowd by being given more detail and more space and more contrast. Others are sketched more lightly, and they're clustered in groups, like the Pharisees at the left, debating what Christ is saying. And the darkness at the far right is the product of closely spaced etched lines that are reinforced by the lines that struck Baldinucci as bizarre, deep, dark lines created by dry point, not etched at all, but gouged directly into the plate and displacing copper to the sides of the grooves, forming what printmakers call burr. And ink uh, in that copper burr makes extra dark lines. We're going to come back to this print, which you can examine for yourselves in the original up in the galleries. 
Uh, but first I want to show you a four minute video clip uh, made by the Philadelphia Museum of Art that demonstrates these techniques of etching and dry point and also uh, Rembrandt's practice of leaving some ink on the plate, uh, not just in the grooves. For both techniques, a copper metal plate is cleaned and the edges are beveled. To make an etching, the plate is evenly covered with an acid-resistant coating made from asphaltum and beeswax. This is known as the ground. The artist uses an etching needle to draw on the ground, and this exposes the metal below. The plate is then immersed in an acid bath. The acid eats away at the exposed metal, creating the lines or grooves in the plate. Dry point is a simple technique that involves using a sharp needle to draw directly into a metal plate, creating a burr, a thin ridge of metal that catches the ink during printing. Dry point was the mysterious technique Rembrandt's critics referred to. For both techniques, the plate is then covered with ink, which is especially pushed into those grooves. The surface is then gently wiped clean with a soft cloth to remove most of the ink from the surface. Rembrandt frequently used selective wiping of the plate to create dramatic atmospheric effects in his etchings. By leaving an ink film of varied density and in different areas of the plate, he was able to create a range of tonal effects much like those seen in his paintings and drawings. Once the ink is wiped, the plate is placed on the press bed and covered with damp printing paper, buffer paper, and layers of blankets. The press bed is slowly rotated between two metal rollers exerting pressure. This causes the damp paper to press into the inked grooves of the copper plate. The paper is taken off the press and a print is made. The dry point scratches create a softer effect, more like a brush stroke, with the ink being heavier on one side of the line and softer on the other. In his 100 Gilder print, Rembrandt dramatically varied the way he wiped the ink each time he printed it, producing almost 100 unique versions of this one image. The Hundred Gilder print is one of the artist's most powerful works of art and a masterpiece of printing. Well, a century earlier, Albrecht Dürer investigated etching. There are five etchings by Dürer in addition to hundreds of engravings and woodcuts. Etching was a less laborious way of cutting grooves into a copper plate than engraving, but Dürer didn't keep it up. Engraved lines have the advantage of varying in width, swelling, and thinning. Etched lines are uniform. 
but they do let the artist use a looser and freer kind of drawing on the plate, comparable to pen drawing. Durer just didn't care to take advantage of that. Parmigianino's etchings around the same time begin to behave like drawings, not exactly spontaneous, but looser than engraving. Etching really got its own identity in the Netherlands while Rembrandt was young. Prints like this small landscape at the bottom by Isaias van der Velde would have suggested to Rembrandt how he could translate his own pen lines into slightly more schematic etched lines. That way, little drawings with familiar scenery like the one at the top uh, could be printed and issued as multiples like the one at the bottom and sold cheaply. Another possibility attracted him at the same time, suggested by this great original mind, Hercules Sagers, that you might make one-off prints, one of a kind, by etching a plate differently in subsequent examples, by, by adding uh, dry point lines, by using colored inks, and even by adding watercolor to the printed sheets. From Rembrandt's inventory, we know that he owned pictures by Sagers, probably to study, and also um, to sell because of his sideline was an activity as an art dealer. From Sagers, Rembrandt absorbed landscape ideas, but also his business model for prints. Each impression from the plate can differ from the last, uh, and because of its rarity, be more valuable as a result. And that must have appealed both to Rembrandt's experimental and his commercial instincts. By the way, the first large exhibition of Hercules Sagers is at the Rijksmuseum now, and it's coming to the Metropolitan in February. You don't want to miss that. We looked in the last lecture at Rembrandt's ambitious um, experiments in painting during the later 20s and early 30s. Um, his etchings also show him trying out new kinds of expressive techniques and doing it with kind of restless energy. He took unconventional an in, uh, unconventional interest in himself as a subject in drawings and paintings and in tiny etchings. Uh, the one at the top uh, here is just an inch and a half square. Uh, etching techniques which he had barely learned. Uh, he had a flair for facial expression as we've been seeing in these lectures and with these little pictures he built up an inventory of emotional states that could serve as models for his narrative scenes. He was becoming one of the most expressive draftsmen in history. In this drawing uh, here down in the middle of an old man bent forward to hear a cripple, heal a cripple, he conveys the man's age and also the volume of his body and cloak. He used the drawing uh, for a scene uh, in the Acts of Apostles uh, where Peter and John meet a crippled beggar at the gate of the temple at the right and Peter heals him. Uh, he used this little self-portrait actually for John uh, at the far right who, who's got Rembrandt's woolly hair. <laughs> he seems to have been experimenting with different acids, so in this etching the lines are com comparatively crudely etched and the contrasts are very strong. Rembrandt had a phase of experimenting with large prints, reproducing history paintings as Rubens had been doing very profitably. And the first of these was based on a spectacular painting of a subject that's always appealed to artists for its high drama, uh, the raising of Lazarus, which you saw in the first lecture. Two sisters, uh, Martha and Mary, have a brother, Lazarus, who's sick, and they ask Christ to come and heal him, but he doesn't come right away, and Lazarus dies. After Christ arrives late, he says he'll res resurrect him. Uh, everybody doubts it. Uh, there's already a bad smell in the tomb, but Christ does it. It's a test of his followers' faith and a prefiguration of what soon happens to Christ himself. So Rembrandt uh, sets the scene in a cave that's hung with a dead man's armor and lit by a mysterious source from the left. <clears throat> Christ speaks the words, Lazarus, come out, and Lazarus does. <clears throat> Rembrandt labored over the composition and in the meantime, his rival and sometimes studio mate uh, from Leiden, Jan Lievens, painted the subject and made this large etching of it, even more theatrical than Rembrandt's version. Christ, you see, um, is in a blaze of, of light, uh, inclined, head inclined towards heaven. 
and Lazarus is obeying. Um, but for the moment, we just see his two hands <coughs> emerging like a horror movie. <coughs> Rembrandt went Levens one better and one bigger, uh, reframing his composition to show a dazed Lazarus between two groups of astonished spectators, some of them recoiling, some advancing as Christ turns away so we can't see his face, but only his gesture of command, hand up, elbow out. Notice another experiment. Rembrandt has supplied the image with a picture frame. I don't know if you can make it out, but it is there. Um, a picture frame, a rippled black band uh, that imitates the flat ebony frames that the Dutch used for prints and drawings. That, plus the rounded top here, claims a special status for the etching. Its format is that of an altarpiece. Uh, in the first lecture, you saw the Passion series that Rembrandt made for the Prince of Orange. Uh, five, you could say, five miniature altarpieces with full-blown action and special effects of light from heaven. In his etchings of these years, uh, Rembrandt produced a few more stunning uh, spectacles. Here, uh, an angel appears in the sky to announce the birth of Christ to the shepherds, who are terrified. The animals are too. And the angel says, fear not, a uh, command that comes too late. They're almost comical in their haste to get out of there. This is an audacious picture in many ways. It's a showpiece of animal locomotion uh, and exotic locale. And above all, it's of nocturnal light effects. Uh, etching this place, plate uh, required a kind of work that was new to Rembrandt. And we have impressions from the unfinished first state to show us the sequence of the work. He began by sketching the whole composition, and then he went to the darkest areas to finish them, working from back to front. The least important areas for the story to begin with, but the most important for the spectacle of light that he wanted to produce. You see a landscape here at the left with a river. A dense web of lines uh, is used to make the rivers and the buildings visible, but very softly, barely indistinguishable. This kind of nocturnal print had been invented recently by the engraver Hendrik Hout, uh, who used engraving to produce, uh, reproduce uh, small paintings by the German painter Adam Elsheimer. Uh, here, it's the flight into Egypt, uh, the refugee holy family making their way through the night and past people camped by the fire uh, that's reflected in the water. It's a motif and a technical challenge that Rembrandt takes up in etching and solves in his own way even more subtly. The main event in this first unfinished state is marvelous uh, to behold, the wonderful outline drawing of the heart of the matter, the fright and flight. Uh, this isn't any deep probing of human complexities. This is, a, this is sheer terror and incomprehension expressed in different ways that involves what looks to us anyway like a minimum of labor. Uh, to the right of center, uh, two cattle are running away, and a cow uh, rises up on her knees. In the middle, a ram, as rams I guess will do, charges head on, head down, while a ewe uh, looks uh, balefully at him. A few other animals are aware that something's not quite right, uh, but they haven't quite reacted yet. If this were a painting, uh, we wouldn't have been intended to see this underdrawing, which this is, uh, but Rembrandt printed this state a few times, uh, quite likely to have a record of it, and also to have something to display to pupils and sell to collectors. This is a new way to value printed pictures. It's not just as finished products, but to value them for the process of making them and the displays of virtuosity involved. Well, here's the finished product where we gain overall unity, a lot of definition. I look, for example, at the two shepherds uh, here to the left. But we've lost the delight of Rembrandt's cartoonish skill at seizing form and movement and emotion with just line. Now, fortunately, you can take your pick. 
Um, in the second state, besides using a denser mesh of lines, Rembrandt deepened the dark by using dry point, his secret weapon. Dry point appears more and more often from this point on. Rembrandt made advances in more intimate scenes too. Uh, this is the climax of the prodigal son story, uh, where the well-to-do young man has left home, squandered his inheritance, sunk to tending pigs, and returns home destitute. His father welcomes him back. And when his virtuous brother complains about it, the father says, be glad that thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and no, now is found. The story was often a chance for artists to show boisterous scenes of high life uh, in contemporary costume, as Rembrandt did 10 years earlier. Uh, he painted it just once in this picture where he showed himself as the prodigal and his wife Saskia uh, as the bad girl. And then he turned to the heart of the parable, which is in the Gospel of Luke, which is, of course, repentance and grace the unearned salvation that was the core of Calvinist belief. No matter how bad you had been, a leap of faith would give you eternal life. It became a favorite subject for Rembrandt. And reconciliation is in the poses. The son kneeling and leaning forward, the father enveloping and embracing the son, the two making a single form, unity in other words, restored. For help with the staging, Rembrandt leafed through his collection of engravings and found a Dutch artist uh, who'd been there already. This is Martin von, Martin von Heemskerk, whose composition and poses and stage extras Rembrandt took over and brought up to date. Heemskerk's uh, prodigal son is um, maybe destitute, but he's, he's still handsome. Uh, Rembrandt's prodigal is something else again. He is frightening to look at. He is hairy and animal-like. Rembrandt is, is not afraid, in other words, to inject ugly, indecorous, crude reality into a scene when it makes a point. He's mastered a technique with the etching needle that abbreviates wherever possible, getting denser when he needs uh, more shade or more emphasis, but remaining sketchy uh, in brighter or less important areas like the left-hand side and the, back, the background. A few years later, Rembrandt comes back to the subject uh, in a pen drawing. The composition is simpler. The extras are reduced to a single boy as a witness. The father holds his son's head in a gesture of benediction. The son is still handsome in profile. There's less exaggeration. Rembrandt was a great etcher in good part because he was a great draftsman. This is all drawn, drawn by the way, with a flexible quill pen with terrific fluency and speed and confidence. Rembrandt came back to the subject yet again at the end of his life. This at the left is a life-size painting in the Hermitage in bad condition, but a moving image nonetheless. The father makes the most eloquent gesture of acceptance and blessing, like, like the priest at an altar. I'll have more to say about this painting in the last lecture. When Rembrandt etches Adam and Eve, um, he uses all his virtuosity. The bright uh, sunlit background uh, here is loose and sketchy. Yes, that is an elephant, um, uh, which uh, Rembrandt had been able to study live in Amsterdam, uh, and is also a familiar symbol of virtue. He outlines his figures confidently uh, in the half shade, and the shadows are luminous, created with hatching and cross-hatching. Closest to us, we can see that he's fortified the deep shadows with dry point. If you look at Raphael's version of the subject, uh, the one that artists knew <coughs> best, uh, and virtually all of them must have known it, you can see that the composition was useful to him, uh, but not the town in the background, um, let alone the idealized uh, physiques. Uh, Rembrandt's Adam uh, is well into middle age, and 
has a very ordinary, unimproved torso, <laughs> and Eve lacks the seductive contraposto that <laughs> Raphael gives her. Not to mention the svelte proportions. Instead, she has the wide bottom and small top that's closer to the Dutch ideal of the time. <laughs> the stunning here, uh, stunning thing here is the um, psychology of the situation. Rembrandt used a drawing here on the left to play with the idea of showing Adam recoiling in horror at Eve's offer of the forbidden fruit. In the etching, she looks um, sly. <laughs> and he's, he's the very picture of indecision. He reaches out with one hand to touch the apple and is resisting with the other hand. It's like a good stage actor. He's wavering with his body and his face. It's a complicated situation. How can you blame him? I, I don't want to ignore, uh, uh, however, the third party in this uh, triangle. Uh, <coughs> Satan is here not as a, tr a snake up a tree, as usual, but as a dragon uh, who really could have climbed up there uh, with these claws of his. He has a scaly tail uh, and bat wings and what reads to me as a greedy expression. So this imagination here and even humor, a willingness to put decorum aside and think how it really might have been with our very human ancestors at the critical moment for all Christian believers, their fall from grace. There's a much less important seduction scene uh, by Rembrandt, but it's shown in a similar spirit. This is a little etching of Joseph refusing the advances of the wife of his boss, Potiphar, uh, in Egypt. Um, there are a lot of mildly titillating versions of, uh, versions of this subject in European art made for collectors who were looking for a little something more than just Bible illustration. <laughs> At the top um, here, um, at the top is the print that served Rembrandt as a starting point. The painting at the left is by a famous Italian contemporary. Uh, by contrast, <coughs> Rembrandt is explicit uh, to the point of pornography and indecorous to the point of comedy. But I have to point out the pictorial devices here, which are very, uh, very wise uh, and artful. I mean the continuous snaky outline uh, from her leg through her arm and shoulders that expresses their entanglement, you could say, and the darkness of the canopy bed to express the sin that she's offering, in contrast to the light into which the virtuous Joseph makes his escape. <laughs> the most ambitious print from these years is this one. Uh, it's in some ways a, a kind of reprise of the Annunciation to the Shepherds in size and especially in extravagant effects. It's another scene of heavenly glory visited on earth, the moment described in the golden legend when the Virgin Mary is on her deathbed, soon to die and be taken up into heaven. It's a bed fit for a queen, and the di disciples surround her like courtiers. In the foreground at the left, there's a sage-like man with a large book, as if to emphasize that the event fulfills prophecy in scriptures. Overhead, angels spill down into the room in a burst of light and billows of clouds. <clears throat> this is the first crowd scene where everybody contributes some personality or emotion. John the Evangelist flings his arms open in a gesture of wonderment. Next to him, several women pray, a doctor takes her pulse, and makes a show of solemn concentration. <laughs> a disciple applies a cloth to her face. Right down the line, you can see how much individual character Rembrandt puts into their faces and poses, and does so, again, with a minimum of lines. Well, the angels <clears throat> overhead are weightless, just quickly sketched, and a mass of lines suggest the parting clouds. All this makes the strongest possible contrast to the deep, dense shadows that he gives to the gravity-bound uh, table uh, here and chairs that are closest to us by adding dry-point lines. <coughs> 
With this variety of etched lines plus dry point, Rembrandt was also able to create subtle and convincing effects of outdoor light. Uh, here, a procession <coughs> is coming out of a shadowy arched area into the light. And look how the figures nearest to us are treated uh, with their features and most details obliterated. The subject is the evil Haman being humiliated by his master Ahasuerus, the king of Babylon, and he deserved it. Uh, Haman had been cruel to Mordecai, an elder of the Jews, and plotted to kill him. Queen Esther, who's a Jew herself, has revealed the plot, and the king punishes Haman by making him lead old Mordecai in a triumphal procession. He's on foot, Haman is, like a groom leading Mordecai's horse. Now remember, it packs a lot in. Um, the king and queen here are visible on a sort of balcony uh, on the right side. The whole mass of unruly spectators, the turning procession, and the powerful architecture that frames the picture. He made this while he was working on a great composition that you all know. And on this little piece of paper on the left, there are many of the pictorial ideas that make the night watch work. By the way, this isn't really the night watch on the right. It's a small 17th century copy that preserves the composition and the colors better than the original, which was cut down. The militiamen are crowded together as the chief officers lead them toward us in a procession. The arch and the buildings play a large role in organizing the composition. That crowd uh, and that architecture also anticipate a picture that particularly interests us. <coughs> the 100 Gilder print was audacious, technically, even by Rembrandt's standard. And never before, never again, would an etcher create such a spectrum of tones from light struck to coal black. And the composition, too, was a great feat of organization. It was based on figure drawings that Rembrandt made of models posed in the studio, a few of the few that have survived. This one was evidently early in the sequence, and it shows quite a different grouping uh, from any in the print. Three others show Rembrandt working out the group of figures to the right of Christ, particularly the woman uh, <coughs> lying on the ground. Um, in one of these drawings, uh, she's sitting uh, at the top, holding her hands in beseeching gesture. The drawing shows the pose uh, in reverse uh, image. That would be reversed in the print. And, uh, here she's included in a group, alert, mouth open, reaching up with one hand, and again at the top in a more careful study. The woman in the etching can only make a feeble gesture with her eyes half closed. She's obviously now closer to ex expiring. The etching is known only in a completed state, not any earlier ones, but there's evidence of many changes of light effects during the work on the plate. Uh, even more, Rembrandt experimented with papers. He used dozens of different papers, slick, matte, absorbent, hard, German and Dutch and Japanese, white, and all shades of sepia, even giving, giving uh, different effects, each one of them giving a different effect. And he inked the plate differently in many examples and wiped it differently, leaving ink on the plate in areas for more tone. There are about a hundred impressions, no two exactly alike. But I haven't said anything about the subject yet, and I, it's time I did. I should say subjects, plural, because Rembrandt combines four different passages in a single verse of the Gospel of St. Matthew that describe Christ preaching in Judea to the faithful and healing the sick. The most important of these is, great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. That's what's happening uh, on the right side. On the left side, there's a discussion going on. Matthew describes how Pharisees, who were conservative Jews, drew Christ into a debate over whether, under the law of Moses, divorce should be legal, 
And the disciples joined in. And meanwhile, there's some commotion just to the left of Christ. Matthew says, they brought children to him to lay hands on with prayer. The disciples rebuked them, Peter. The disciples rebuked them, but Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not try to stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. What you see is Peter pushing one mother away with his right hand, where Christ, on the other hand, makes a welcoming gesture. Just below, uh, there's here, uh, just a little bit in from the left, there's an uncertain-looking mother toting a baby. The little son steps forward, tugging at her robe and pointing at Christ. He's got the message. The dog isn't just local color. His form initiates that big upward curve that connects this section of the picture to the form of Christ. Christ commands that little children be brought forward because they have a claim on life and a, a salvation. It's th theirs is the kingdom of heaven. On the other side uh, are the sick, starting with a standing man uh, closest to him, the shadow he casts uh, on Christ's robe is quite a wonderful touch. The shadow of his imploring hands and his profile, a person without power or substance in the world, but a soul who makes a claim on Christ on behalf of the multitude that Matthew says was following him. They're in the half shadows physically and mentally afflicted, some on foot, some on a, one in a wheelbarrow. Many of them are helping others or gesturing to others, stressing their unselfishness. You can see how rich and subtle all this is and how the lines almost disappear in an illusion of pure tone. One detail you don't see uh, is at the far right edge, under the arch. Ooh, let's see. Can make it out? It's a camel, uh, which would be an ex expensive transportation uh, for poor people. It's probably there as a reminder of another remark Christ made right after he blessed the children. Matthew describes the dilemma of a rich young man who was unsure whether he could give up all his riches in order to follow Christ. Rembrandt includes a fair-haired, beardless, finely dressed young man, withdrawn from what's going on around him, pondering his problem as the camel waits at the gate. So Rembrandt's picture is a compilation, a scene based on excerpts that he's pieced together to make a detailed image of the essence of Christ's message, which is not about theology, but about compassion for the have-nots, for the neediest in society. A few years after this exhausting uh, project, Rembrandt made something related but far simpler. There isn't any biblical passage illustrated. The cast is smaller here. The architecture still important but clearer. In fact, there's a kind of stage space and a symmetrical layout that's classical in its organization and clarity. The picture is about Christ's teaching and its reception in the back streets by an audience of various ages and classes, some of them absorbed by hearing it, some skeptical, but all visibly drawn to it. There's more dry point here. Um, and again, we don't have any trial states, just a fully achieved image that Rembrandt could vary from impression to impression by inking the plate differently and using different papers. The people are of all ages, and they are wonderful. The child um, who's put aside the top he's been playing with and is tracing something on the ground. The young man uh, lost in thought. The rapt listeners, one seen from behind. Old men, bored or sleepy 
and an elder coming forward uh, to, towards Christ. Now, Rembrandt's career as a printmaker is going to end in about five years after this, but in that time, he made two very large scenes of the Passion that put together all his virtuosity and his historical imagination. Both of them entirely in dry point, the lines gouged directly into the plate with no etching with acid. There were many changes that we can follow through three states in this case, and then a fourth. And there were innumerable variations of inking and paper. Rembrandt shows Christ at the last moments of his life, when there was darkness over the earth, and the veil of the temple was rent, and when Christ cried out, into thy hands I commend my spirit. As critical as this moment is for Christian theology, there's another that follows, and that's when the Roman centurion, who's been watching all this, gets down from his horse and converts to Christ on the spot. This was the all-important leap of faith that Luther and Calvin prescribed. You see it uh, in this Italian print, which Rembrandt evidently used for the centurion's pose. You see it a century earlier in a picture upstairs by the German painter Lukas Cranach, where the all-important words are spelled right out uh, on the panel. The words are truly, this was the Son of God. Here you see the contrast between the scratched dry point outlines, <coughs> almost all the work on this frieze of figures, which has very little detail, but lots of white paper to convey the dazzling spill of light, and the dug-in grooves of the tool, which lots of burr to capture the ink. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea are leaving the scene, perhaps to prepare the tomb for Christ, which is suggested by this deep <coughs> opening, <coughs> cave-like <coughs> at the right. I want to look again <coughs> at the people at the foot of the cross. Now, mind you, this is a finished work of art, not a sketch. Rembrandt signed it and sold many dozens of examples. <coughs> We look at abbreviation like this with eyes that are accustomed to it. We know the story of the triumph of sketchiness up through Impressionism and into our own lifetimes. <clears throat> we know how Cezanne reduced volumes to their bare essentials. It's hard for us to be surprised by what we see here, but had any artist ever made a finished work that rendered the human figure with so few lines? Not just hu any human figures either. This is the mother of God, and an evangelist, and disciples. And just look at the group around Mary. You see they all have mantles and sleeves and caps, as well as expressive poses and facial uh, expressions, and convincing weight, gravity. And all this information from, I don't know, 40 or 50 lines, the bare minimum of details and shading. Look at the man, for example, at the far right, craning his neck to look up tilting his shoulders, tugging at his cloak. Uh, look at John the Evangelist um, in despair, his expression, his costume. Bright light is responsible for obliterating detail, and at the same time it invites a show of skill in transcription that had not been seen before. And this was for a scene that the artist believed was the most important event in human history. Rembrandt made many impressions on various papers and a dozen or so on vellum, on goat skin in other words, which is a less absorbent material than most papers and takes dry point especially well. The burr of the lines in the copper was wearing off as he printed, and sto so he stopped and he went at the plate again, and the result was a total transformation. He burnished away most of his earlier design, and he redrew it, making many changes. The crowd at the left is gone. The cave on the right is gone. He put the centurion on his horse, making him more prominent but less emotive. His conversion isn't emphasized as much. 
he added great streaks of shadow that swallow up the two thieves. And he muted the bright light by laying down a new mesh of lines. Now it really is darkness at noon. In some places, you have to work hard to see what's going on. The effect is even stranger than before, more remote from us, stripped of anything that isn't essential to Rembrandt's conception. And Rembrandt's conception, conception seems to be to stun the viewer uh, with a profound event. Rembrandt found a model uh, for the centurion uh, in a Renaissance medal by Pisanello showing a Milanese warlord in profile. Uh, just what that choice signifies is hard to know, not a learned reference probably, but an archaic stylized touch, very different from the big gesture uh, over on the far left of the first centurion. Two years later, Rembrandt turned to another scene from the Passion, the same <coughs> large size <coughs> as the crucifixion, and again done entirely in dry point. This is the moment when Christ, having refused to respond to accusations, <coughs> has been turned over by the priests to the Roman governor, Pilate. Pilate doesn't think he's guilty, and because it's a holiday, he follows the custom of releasing a prisoner that the crowd chooses. The priests have already told the crowd that they should pick Barabbas, the thief, and in a moment they will do just that. Rembrandt makes the governor's palace grand and oppressive both. The mob is a kind of entertaining cross-section of the populace, people of all ages, seen from the back with an unposed sort of momentary look. Not many faces, just costumes and gestures. The scene on the dais presents Pilate, uh, the one in the big turban at the left, almost sympathetically as he asks the mob to choose between Barabbas and Christ. Barabbas is that uh, squinty uh, thug in the center. Already, a servant at the left has brought uh, water and a basin to Pilate so that he can wash his hands of the whole affair. And Christ stands a little to one side in a kind of resigned, complete resignation and acceptance. Uh, in this impression, you can see how the dry point lines have their blurry, soft focus character still intact, but again, after many printings, the plate was wearing, and again, Rembrandt went over it to extend its life and make some major changes. In this state, that entertaining mob is gone. He may have felt that it was upstaging the main actors, but in any case, we now, uh, we spectators, can imagine that that we are the mob, that the mob is us, the mob that's ready to have Christ crucified. That idea of complicity that had been re in Rembrandt's mind for a long time, for at least 30 years, you saw it in the surface in those passion scenes he painted for the Prince of Orange, where he actually cast himself as one of the executioners. Rembrandt replaced the crowd with something strange and sinister, here at the left, um, two, express, two massive arched openings into some subterranean place, a dungeon maybe. Between the arches, there's a large shadowy bearded head and shoulders, which seems to be part of a river god statue of the kind that was often displayed on the ground floor of Renaissance buildings, but whose significance here has never really been well explained. Rembrandt kept the bearded man uh, at the right uh, here, who steps forward at the edge his head still up in wonderment. You remember the afflicted man uh, here in the Hundred Gilder print, casting a shadow on the garment of Christ, acknowledging his connection to and dependence on the Redeemer, which it seems to be what Rembrandt's intention was uh, in the work on the right. In the 1650s, Rembrandt continued to make small etchings of biblical subjects. This is one the size of a postcard. It isn't a story. It's a made-up scene of the Madonna and child indoors by a fire with a cat sleeping. Rembrandt gives it seemingly accidental touches of s sanctity, 
uh, her halo here, is emphasized by the window pane. The canopied chair uh, here, like a throne that she's stepped down from to sit on the floor and assume the attitude, the traditional guise of the Madonna of Humility. Joseph uh, here is not divine, uh, unlike his wife and child, and he's often portrayed as a humble, helpful outsider, which he is here, literally, touch touchingly, outside looking in. What Rembrandt learned in the large drypoint prints of the Passion, he applied to a scene of Christ's entombment. Uh, he began with little or no ink on the face of the plate, just in the etched and dry point grooves. There's a convincing bright patch of light from an unseen lantern and a subtle play of hatching and cross-hatching on the vault of the tomb here and on the huddle of mourners who are each shown with the simplest, most direct outlines. This print would be a masterpiece um, of printmaking if Rembrandt had stopped there. But then after some more work, he printed some impressions with a lot of ink left on the plate and just a little wiped off, painted on the plate, you could almost say. This nearly obliterated the setting. And later settings, settings rather, of this same plate have still some surface tone still have a mood of deep gloom and sorrow, but this has pools of light that have the effect of a kind of subtle stage illumination, pulling the key elements out of the surrounding gloom. Well, I put a lot of emphasis on narrative subjects, um, mainly biblical, because those are Rembrandt's greatest contributions to printmaking. But he used the medium for other subjects, and I'll show you a few portraits first. A few lectures ago, we saw how Rembrandt became the leading portrait painter in Amsterdam in the 1630s. All kinds of important citizens sat for him. The portrait etchings are mostly combined, uh, confined to uh, Rembrandt's circle of acquaintances and friends. Uh, we're going to look at his etched self-portraits in the next lecture. And one of these men was the tax inspector for the Stadtholder, uh, the Prince of Orange. Uh, this man, Jan Artebuchart, uh, who Rembrandt got to know through his dealings over the Passion series that he painted for the prince. This man was also an art collector, and it's been speculated that, that this portrait was a favor by Rembrandt to ingratiate, him, ingratiate himself uh, to the court, like the painting of Samson that Rembrandt tried to offer as a gift to the prince's right-hand man, Constantin Huygens, but was refused. Anyway, it's a picture of the tax man at work, uh, with bags of coins, a ledger, staff of helpers. He's splendidly dressed in old-fashioned costume of velvet and fur. It may be a good likeness of Artebohart, we can't know that, but it's also an inventory of goods that Rembrandt enumerates with the care that he'd soon apply to the poor and the sick in the Hundred Guilder print. It's also a permanent record of this official's performance of a duty to society. A portrait of the following year shows another man in the performance of his duties. Uh, these are studies of Cornelis Onslow, a preacher of a liberal Mennonite congregation that his father-in-law, Hendrik Eilenberg, belonged to. At the right, um, he's got Onslow sitting at a table, gesturing to a book, which would be a Bible. It's evidently a study for the etching. The other drawing shows Onslow full length at the far side talking to somebody outside the frame, and again, gesturing. He used it for this life-size painting, uh, which is one of the greatest portraits he ever painted, and one of the most effective characterizations, a double portrait of, his pre of the preacher, uh, Anslow, and his wife, Altje Schouten, who is shown as a person in need of consolation or instruction. And Anslow provides it. Mouth open in speech, leaning towards her, gesturing uh, towards the source of wisdom and comfort, the scriptures, propped up and dramatically lit. Ephraim Bonus, or Bueno, was a distinguished physician. His portrait, like the tax collector's, has a blank strip at the bottom for someone to insert an engraved 
inscription praising the man in prose or poetry, which was never added. In this case, we have no preparatory drawing, but instead we've got something much more unusual, an oil sketch that Rembrandt used for the etching with a few changes. The print shows him standing, as you see, uh, instead of sitting, in action rather than in repose. He's worked up the head with a dense mesh of lines to suggest the shifting light of the interior, and it seems to me also suggests the mobile and subtle mind behind the eyes. In his technique, Rembrandt was working the same level of the 100 Gilder print. In another print of the same year, the technical and the spiritual merge again. This is a portrait of a man who became a close friend the patrician businessman and poet Jan Six. There had been nothing like this in Dutch portraiture. Six is shown sort of unbuttoned, informally posed, in a setting that's full of allusions to Six's status, the sword of a gentleman. The tall room and the fine windows, and details that speak of how he wishes to be regarded, above all, as a literary man, books and papers that he's reading, and as a connoisseur, thus the painting on the wall, protected from the light by a little curtain that's half pulled aside. The light in the room not only lets him read, but also suggests his enlightened state of mind. There are subtleties of tone and texture that weren't present even in the 100 Gilder print. Look at the highlights on his shoulder and sleeve, and the shadows of the drapery, which he intensified with dry point. Look how the sword handle uh, here gleams in the half light, and the books. Six was just 29 years old, a dozen years younger than Rembrandt, <coughs> and he was bound for distinction. So it served Rembrandt's interest to give this portrait exceptional attention. Seven years later, Six had his portrait painted by Rembrandt this time as a country gentleman in a riding coat, which Rembrandt painted with a broad, suggestive brushwork that's close to the limit of his virtuosity. He did that knowing that Jan Six, as a connoisseur and a virtuoso in his own right, would understand, would recognize uh, the skill involved in, in painting him. One last portrait of Jan Lutma, a successful goldsmith and silversmith. Rembrandt gives him several attributes of his profession, as you see, tools as well as finished works. I include it simply to show how much shrewdness and kindness Rembrandt could put into an etched likeness. He's still, but not static. He contracts his forehead slightly and looks at us sidelong with a suggestion that his expression will change. Every hair in his head and beard seems alive. Rembrandt had been capturing human quirks for a long time. Portraits gave him some latitude for this, but not as much as pictures of ordinary people and everyday events, so-called genre subjects. Now, these were an established tradition in printmaking. From the start of his career, beggars and poor people aroused Rembrandt's curiosity and affection and sometimes admiration. These are two such pictures, <clears throat> 16 years apart, with similar subjects, treated very differently in ways that reveal how Rembrandt grew and developed as an artist, and, and you could say as well as a human. At the left, a door-to-door -door rat catcher is offering his services, but the prospective customer isn't having any. Uh, he's making a theatrical face and literally giving the back of his hand to the rat man. Notice the uh, pet on the rat man's sh shoulder. <clears throat> It's caricatured in the faces and the costumes, played for laughs, or at least for smiles, and the etching needle is busy, busy, busy with crabbed lines for picturesque textures. The scene uh, dates, this one, from the time of the 100 Gilder print, and I think you feel its compassionate spirit. The old man at the door gives a coin, to the hurdy-gurdy player. Um, 
and his family, people who come to him, and it seems that nobody's dig dignity is diminished by this. And Rembrandt's technique is suitably spare and unshowy. My speedy finale is a quick look at Rembrandt's landscape prints. Uh, I forgot. I put the hog in here. Um, I really meant to take it out. But anyway, there's a detail, um, <laughs> um, which gives you a kind of delicious, delicious, spontaneous kind of way of treating all the details in a scene that does not have a happy ending. In, in the background, a knife is being sharpened. Um, here, um, you saw at the beginning of this lecture uh, something of the tradition that Rembrandt inherited uh, with etched landscapes. These had quite a different, si different subjects and ambitions. Uh, local scenery uh, by Isaias van der Velde, half a dozen other talented printmakers too, a plain style, and the strange views of Hercules Sagers at the top, foreign looking, even lunar looking, elaborately etched and sometimes printed in color. When he turned to landscape painting in the 1640s, it was actually Sager's kind of <coughs> vision that he, uh, uh, that he embodied uh, most. Uh, his paintings um, are of fantastic mountains and rivers and are interesting exactly because they're not local, not contemporary, but vaguely historical and fantastic. Not so with the etchings. It was local scenes here that attracted him, the sort of plain-spoken vernacular picture language that he chose. Here he treats the flat surroundings of Amsterdam with a delight in the open spaces and a lot of attention to the particulars, the meandering inlet uh, that bordered by grasses and muddy banks, the dense city towers and mills and ships. Did he sit out there uh, in the field, drawing right on the plate? It's also fresh that you bl believe he might well have done that, un although that would have been unlikely. His other landscapes of the period are breathtaking, but not quite as convincing uh, spatially as this one. Uh, this is a panorama at the top in which Rembrandt picks up the tradition of wide-angle views like the one at the bottom by S.I.S. von der Velde and makes the world seem to turn on a single dilapidated farm building. On the right, uh, an idyllic patch uh, of river with a castle um, and here, a distant view of a city across the land. Rembrandt assembled the view in his studio using drawings uh, like the one uh, underneath, uh, you could say, field notes. Um, that must have been true uh, here, too. The most ambitious of his landscape prints, uh, by far, almost a foot wide, with the full range of his techniques on display, including dry point in the shadows, plus something he never attempts before or after, real weather passing through, slanting rain, roiling clouds, and the bright sun coming out in the distance. He wasn't recording an actual place, but creating a kind of composite that would be satisfying and credible and vivid and embody the benevolent forces in nature in Calvinist's terms God's gift to humans. He walks in the countryside around Amsterdam, and these walks gave him lots of material. Here, something distinctive about the geography of the western provinces, water everywhere, and your vantage point is down low. But those give you long views into the distance at times, and there are startling jumps of fee, a scale um, in your field of view, like the masts here up close to us and the far distance, jumps of scale that give you a measure of dis the great distance between the two. Of all the landscape etchings, this is the sketchiest, uh, just sheer virtuosity, a kind of drawing uh, in multiple. And that kind of open light treatment recurs in a distant view at the right in another etching he made in the same year, at a spot on the Amstel outside the city. On the left, though, is something entirely different and wonderful, a cluster of trees, including an ancient willow, uh, juxtaposed to the prosaic life of the everyday river and town, this 
bunch of greenery conceals a pair of lovers, a man crowning the woman with a wreath like a shepherd in an Arcadian romance of the kind that the Dutch were reading and writing at the same time. Rembrandt takes that twisted tree, uh, ancient and putting out leaves nonetheless, and makes it into a saintly attribute. It belongs here to a retired bishop, Jer Jerome, who's living <clears throat> in the rocky wilderness. The tree has been fashioned into a drop front desk, um, handy for his work uh, of translating the Bible. And his other attribute, a faithful lion, looks out for him. <clears throat> This panorama of the fields of Blumendahl is one of a kind for Rembrandt. It's a view of a real place across the fields towards Harlem, a real locale that other artists had found, but Rembrandt makes a sort of super wide angle view of. It's a locale he studied in drawings, like this one at the left. And he surely knew and may have owned Hercules Sager's etching uh, on the right, but he did away with alternating light and dark fields and relied on diminishing scale and diagonals to create the breathtaking deep space here. One last etching to end with, <coughs> a tiny picture of a goldsmith. <coughs> Not a portrait, but the image of a nameless artist in his studio. His fire for melting metal is beside him. He holds a hammer. And he stands with his arm around a statue that he's evidently made and put on a pedestal. Not just any statue, but it's a statue of the ancient symbol of caritas, charity, a mother holding her children. The sculptor tilts his head the way she does. Both are parents, the image is saying. The work of art is the child not just of their inspiration, but also of hard, exacting manual work. This man has applied himself to shaping the metal, just as Rembrandt has etched the plate. And this moment of loving satisfaction with the work is one that Rembrandt understands, and I think we can share. In the next lecture, we'll see how Rembrandt saw himself in the mirror and presented himself in his self-portraits. So I invite you to come back. Thank you. Thank you.